So thank you for coming. Uh, I guess the scientists had no choice because they're here for the week anyway. But uh, thanks for our neighbours uh, for coming to the Dorcas Cummings Lecture. Uh, this is the Cold Spring Harbour Symposium uh, that we're having. We're in the middle of a meeting, which you'll hear a lot more about uh, from our speaker. But uh, the symposium started in 1993. It was the first meeting that were organised at Cold Spring Harbour uh, Laboratory, and it's still our premier meeting. We have about 30 meetings a year, but the Cold Spring Harbour Symposium is our premier meeting. And uh, it, this year it's on a very exciting topic. And uh, it's been traditional to have a public lecture. This year, as you'll see, we're going to do it slightly differently, and I'm not going to um, say much more than other than welcome. And uh, I'm going to turn it over to John Ingalls, who's Executive Director of the Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory Press, who it turns out, we found out, is turns out to be an unbelievably good interviewer. So, uh, Jim, you're going to get grilled. <laughs> so, John Ingalls. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Bruce, and um, let me add my welcome to everybody here. Thank you for coming, and uh, it's great to see so many familiar faces in the audience, both among the scientific attendees and, and from our friends and neighbors uh, in the area. Um, so it is my pleasure and a privilege to introduce this year's Dorcas Cummings Lecture. Um, named lectures are extremely rare at Cold Spring Harbor, and this is our oldest and our most prestigious. It commemorates the life and work of Dorcas Oakley Cummings, a long-time and much-admired resident of our neighboring village, Laurel Hollow. And in the 60s and 70s, she was involved with many organizations devoted to preserving the special character of the North Shore of Long Island. And one of those organizations was the Long Island Biological Association, which was the predecessor to the present-day Cold Spring Harbor Association, a group of neighbors and friends who do an enormous amount to support this institution. And I see many members here this evening. So when Dorcas Cummings died, much too young, in 1976, her family and friends created an endowment to fund a lasting memorial to her memory. And this took the form of an annual spring lecture intended for the community and intended to convey to our neighbors and friends the excitement and importance of biomedical research. The first lecture was given in 1978, and except during the pandemic, there has been one every year since. And they're now scheduled to coincide with the annual Cold Spring Harbor Symposium, as Bruce says, said, and the invited speaker is a participant in that meeting. And because the symposium every year has a different scientific theme, and the invited attendees are the world's leading specialists in that topic, the Dorcas Cummings lecturers have been an incredibly uh, outstanding group of scientists from many different specialties. Um, but they all share the fact that they are renowned for the originality and the impact of their contributions to biomedical research. And this year continues that long and impressive tradition. The Dorcas Cummings Lecturer for 2023 is Professor James Wells from the Division of Developmental Biology of the Children's Hospital Research Foundation in Cincinnati, Ohio. He is also the Chief Scientific Officer in the Center for Stem Cell and Organoid Medicine at Children's Hospital Medical Center. Jim and his colleagues have been pioneers in the development of techniques for coaxing human stem cells to grow in culture dishes to form three-dimensional assemblies called organoids. And they have focused particularly on the gastrointestinal tract creating organoids that do multiple gut-associated things, like, di like secreting digestive enzymes and acid, releasing hormones, and absorbing nutrients. And this is tremendously exciting science, and Jim gave a spectacular talk about his work in the symposium last night. 
Jim set up his own lab in Cincinnati in, 20, in 2002. He moved there after doing a postdoc at Harvard. And before that, he was a PhD student in the graduate program in genetics just down the road at Stony Brook University. And during that time, he attended events here, including Dorcas Cummings lectures. So, for many reasons, it's a particular pleasure to welcome Jim back to Cold Spring Harbor. And he's going to talk to us about growing human organs in the lab and how the technologies he and his colleagues have helped create are giving us an understanding of human embryonic development, the development of disease, and new approaches to therapies. So Jim is going to talk for about 20 minutes, and then he'll take the stage for a conversation with me, but also with you. So we would like you to think about your questions and your comments. There will be roving microphones in the audience, and please feel free to ask Jim anything that his talk stimulates. So with that, let me hand you over to our 2023 lecturer, Jim Wells. Well, it's, it's never good to start a, a talk when you've become speechless by a very generous uh, and, and, and uh, a fantastic introduction. And John and Bruce and Terry, uh, I really appreciate the uh, invitation. And I'm going to wander around. Podiums kind of make me feel a little bit hemmed in. Um, so this is just a general sort of overview about what I want to talk to you today. And in reality, uh, many of the scientists in the audience, uh, as much as 20 years ago, would put up a slide like this saying, someday we might be able to have a patient walk in the, in the hospital and, and from that patient make uh, uh, stem cells that are specific to that patient. And maybe someday we can turn those stem cells into, into tissues for that patient to help them therapeutically recover from a, a horrible disease, a degenerative disease. Or maybe we can use that patient's own stem cells and, and, and tissues to screen for drugs that might help them recover from a, from a, from a disease. Because as you know, some drugs work with some patients and not others. However, today, in the last 20 years, this is not something that we would like to do in the future. It's something we're doing today. So today, any of you can walk into the hospital, the medical center, and with just a few drops of blood, we can make stem cells from, from that. And we can now turn those stem cells through tricks in the laboratory. We can coax them to form any different type of tissue, from insulin-producing beta cells to brain cells to kidney to liver to whatever. And we can use them to try to understand what's wrong, you know, uh, uh, do a diagnostic or screen for drugs, test new drugs on, on the tissues that we grow in the lab uh, first before putting them into you as a patient. And ultimately, and what I'll talk about at the end, we're, uh, we, when I say we, I mean me and a lot of my colleagues in the audience uh, are now using these to uh, uh, develop new therapeutic tissue replacements for diseases. So just a little bit of background about me. This is uh, me working hard in the lab at Stony Brook in grad school. It's just to remind uh, me and, and you all that uh, uh, so one of my most formative research experiences was just down the road from here. And I spent many hours here at Cold Spring Harbor, sometimes doing this, but usually doing, uh, uh, coming out here to listen to the amazing science. And uh, uh, I, I did my thesis research at, with Sid Strickland on, on a, a basic question of, how do cells decide in the body what to do, what to become? If they have a choice between becoming a bone or a muscle cell, how do they make that decision? Um, now, I also had the privilege of having lecturers uh, uh, who, at the time and still, are really the rock stars of genetics and molecular biology. And, and here's just a handful of lectures I had. So imagine you're a student sitting there, and, and, and you're waiting for the lecture to show up, and in walks Bruce Stillman. And you're sitting there, and you're like, all right, I better get my game on. It's sort of like if any of you play tennis, it's sort of like you show up at your tennis court for your lesson, and, and in walks this person. You know, it's, it's just, it's, it's, 
it's daunting. So I, I'm having a little bit of my graduate student anxiety standing here in front of you because, because of, of, of this. Um, now, after I finished my graduate work, and I became really fascinated by this question, how do cells decide what to do? How do they know what to do? And I, I moved into the next most complicated question around there, and how during develop, embryonic development can it just a ball of cells go on to form an entire embryo and ultimately the, the entirety of the organism? And again, my focus was mostly on the organs of the gastrointestinal tract, including the, the pancreas. So this is something that many of us study. It's still a fundamentally fascinating question, but it also has paved the way for a, a concept that I became interested in when I was a postdoc fellow in Doug Melton's lab in Boston. And that is, could we maybe learn from the embryo who is the master at making organs? Could we maybe learn from the embryo and, and start with stem cells and teach stem cells how to become these organs in the laboratory? So this segues into telling you what are stem cells. Now, stem cells have been around for decades. And there are two general flavors of stem cells. There are stem cells that some organs, not all organs, this is important, but some organs, like the blood, the skin, or the intestine, they have their own stem cells. And they do really well at, at making sure those organs stay healthy. Even in a disease case, they're pretty good at repairing the organs. But other, other organs don't have their own stem cells. Pancreas, for example. Uh, beta, when beta cells get killed in people with type 1 diabetes, the body doesn't have a natural stem cell to replace it. So for that reason, I became interested in this other stem cell type. Now, these are called pluripotent stem cells. It's, it's, it's a big word, but all it just means is it, it's exactly how it sounds. Potent, pluri, it means just these are stem cells that can become any cell type of the body. So this is, a, this is just a, a, a little group of, of cells grown in a Petri dish, about 1,000. These cells, when treated and, and pushed in the right direction, can become any of these cell types. So they can become pancreatic beta cells. They can become hepatocytes. They can become brain neurons or, or eye cells. So they're really remarkable. So with this in mind, I, I, and this idea that maybe we could use stem cells to try to replicate some of making organs, um, I started to look around for my own, uh, a place that I might go to start my own laboratory to explore this basic idea that can we turn these these stem cells that we grow in the laboratory into any of these organs in, in, a, in a process that maybe kind of replicates what the embryo does. So with that in mind, I decided to go to Cincinnati. And, and the reason I went to Cincinnati was a number of reasons. First of all, the, the Children's Hospital has the first pediatric research center in the, in the country. It's been around since 1938. And they really value fundamental research there. But they really value it. They support it They're with a hundred, uh, one and a half million square feet of research space, and there's a, over a thousand faculty. But what they also support is they support the basic research and maybe figuring out ways to use research discoveries to help improve patient care. So basically, they cram a bunch of physicians and scientists together in this research foundation and say, "Go sort it out. You do the basic research. You help us." Uh, figure out new therapeutics for, for pediatric patients. So since moving there and over the past 20 years, in fact, we have been able to do, honestly, it's beyond my wildest dreams how, how lucky we've been and, and to generate different, different tissues from pluripotent stem cells, all in a Petri dish, all in the laboratory. So now we can turn human pluripotent stem cells into tissues that we call organoids. And again, my focus is more on the gastrointestinal tract, but as I'll mention later, my colleagues in the audience can, can do the same thing, except at the end of the day, they turn these cells into uh, small things that almost are like mini brains, that's what they ca call them, into mini livers, into mini kidneys, mini hearts, all sorts of different mini organoids. Um, so I've, mentioned, I've used the word now, the organoid word, what's an organoid? Uh, basically, organoids, just simply put, are miniature versions of, of proper organs. So this is an organoid, a stomach organoid, that is just 
maybe uh, a quarter of an inch or, or a few millimeters in size. And this is a, a, a developing stomach, which will, at the end of the day, in, our, in us, stomachs are, are inches and inches long. But these, these organoids are actually pretty cool in that they can do a lot of the things that the actual organs do. So our, our stomach organoids secrete acid. We can get them to, to, to mix up just like as if they're mixing up food. So they're, they're pretty cool. So here's a, a, just a, a fun cartoon movie about how we make organoids in the lab. So at the beginning of this movie, we would control what the cells do just by dumping a bunch of chemicals on them. And these are special chemical cues that tell them exactly what to become. So if we add certain cues, they can become intestine. If we add a different set of cues, they become stomach. But at the end of the day, they grow into these things called organoids. Now this is a schematic of an intestinal organoid. But everybody likes to use these movies. Or does it actually actually look like that? So here's what it looks like in the dish. These are a bunch of stem cells that we've pushed towards becoming an intestine. And right about here, you can see one of these early stage organoids just popping out of the dish. And we would scoop those up and continue to grow them. And they can become, again, one of these different organoids. Now, this is just uh, an example, uh, and if it, people are like me and they like that British baking show, this is sort of a fully cooked organoid, you know, the one you pull out at the end, and, you know, if, if Paul Hollywood were here, I'd be waiting for a handshake. But, um, but what I'm doing here is actually showing you a really thin slice of, of, a, of an organoid, a stomach organoid, and the other picture is a thin slice of an actual human stomach. Now, when I say thin, I mean like when you go to the deli and ask for really thin prosciutto, this is 300 times thinner. Now, but, and I've, we've color-coded what the different tissues are in that or in the stomach. So there's, there's muscle to help you mix the food. There's, there's nerves. And then these are the cells that make the acid. So um, which one is the human stomach and which one is our engineered organoid? I'm not going to look for a show of hands. I'm just going to tell you the answer. Um, this is a human stomach. This is our organoid. They, they look pretty much similar. But more importantly, our stomach organoids, and again, this is just one example, they secrete acid, and they, they, they undergo this sort of mixing motion that we can trigger. And here's actually one doing it right now. This is a, a gastrointestinal organoid that uh, it thinks it's actually part of the, the GI tract, and it's trying to mix the food up now. But it's amazing that it actually does pretty much the same thing as the actual organ does. So we can make organoids. Um, oh, and, and I want to mention, this is to remind me, um, I'm showing you some of the organoids we make. As I mentioned, organoids now come in all flavors. And, and the folks and the scientists in the audience over the past 10 years have generated organ, organoid equivalents of pretty much every organ in your body, with very few exceptions. Brain, heart, liver, kidney, gut, uh, they're all out there. Um, and you can generate organoids, as I mentioned, from those e either types of stem cells. But it, it's really uh, impressive. So now the question is, we have all these organoids. What are we going to do with them? Now, that's where I think I, I've really under-anticipated the utility of these cells. Because how they're being used really is just blowing my mind as well. And, and here are just some examples of how we're using them. I'm going to go through and just give you some examples. So say for, uh, in one case, we had a patient come in into our hospital with a, a congenital malformation of, of their pancreas. And um, that was easy to spot because they largely were missing the pancreas. So anyone could probably spot that, probably even me, and I'm not a clinician. Um, and we made stem cells from that patient because the patient was complaining of other complications so other gastrointestinal complications, pain and digestive problems, and all the different workups that the clini clinicians put the patient through did not discover what the problem was. So we're like, all right, why don't we let the patient rest, stop poking and prodding them, but let's make some stem cells from the patient and do an organoid-type diagnostic in the laboratory. So while the patient was, was, was being looked at for, for other things, we thought we'd do a diagnostic and try to figure out what's wrong with the intestine and stomach in there. And what we found was a bunch of new pathologies that were subtle enough that the pathologists missed them. Um, we validated the fact that they had a pathology in organoid. We went back to the patient, and in fact, they did have that problem. And it had, the patient had a bunch of problems that I won't go into. But the important thing is we then 
met with the clinicians and came up with a, an improved clinical plan that the patient is now much better off with their, their complications. And again, those were all discovered using organoids in the laboratory. And again, that's one example. This is being done around the world to look at, patho at new pathologies and discover things across the board from uh, autism spectrum disorder to diabetes to et cetera. So, so organoid diagnostics is one really exciting use that I think we didn't fully appreciate how, how amazing that might be. Uh, another use I want to point out is, is really an area that we, we had hoped these would be useful, and that is uh, drug discovery and, and, and testing, preclinical testing of drugs. Now, as you all know, find, uh, uh, finding drugs that work in humans can be really challenging because you have to start, historically you start with studying drugs in animals and then maybe other things, uh, and sometimes they work great in animals, but they don't work in humans. So in this case, we can actually start with an array of actual human organ cell types and screen for drugs using that. So for example, in the audience, uh, uh, there are a number of fantastic organoid biologists uh, that have used organoids to test cystic fibrosis drugs. Your, your own Dave Tuvison is using organoids to pre-screen chemotherapeutics for, for pancreatic cancer. My colleague Taka Takebi is using organoids to, to discover new uh, drugs for liver disease, etc. Uh, Christine Mumry is studying or CART organoids to, to uh, try to uh, improve arrhythmias. So hundreds of labs around the world are using organoids to, to screen for drugs and to pre-screen drugs before putting them into patients. Um, my own lab has discovered, we think, a therapeutic for patients who suffer from life-threatening forms of malabsorption. So organoids have really been absolutely transformative when it comes to what we call precision medicine. But lastly, and I think what most of you are, uh, uh, would get most excited about, are cell and tissue therapeutics from, from, from stem cells and organoids. So this number here represents the number of people just in the U.S. who are waiting for organ transplants. This number here is the number of patients who actually get them. So the shortage of organ cells and organs for transplantation is, is really debilitating for, for tens of thousands of people, again, just in this country. So clearly stem cells and organoids as a renewable source of cells and tissues for transplantation really, I mean, it, it does make the hair on the back of my neck stand up for, for that. So for, for years, actually, uh, 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 adult stem cells um, uh, have been developed for decades to, to, uh, to be used as therapeutic. And far and away, the best example and the first example are blood stem cells. And again, um, in the audience behind you are the, the world-leading experts at blood stem cells, understanding them and using them for therapeutics. Um, however, blood stem cells are great at making blood, but they can't make things like, as I said, pancreatic beta cells or gut tissues, things like that. So that's where these other stem cells, which can become any of these, are, I think have the, are, are emerging as a very exciting source of new cellular therapeutics. So here's one example. Uh, uh, a lot of the, uh, pioneered really from uh, uh, my former postdoctoral advisor, Doug Melton, and that is turning those pluripotent stem cells into insulin-producing beta cells to treat people with type 1 diabetes. And this was covered in the New York Times, and, and early clinical trials of these stem cell-derived beta cells suggest that they may actually transform the, the lives of people with diabetes uh, for their, their ability to, to get them off insulin and, and let them lead normal lives. This is just one example, though. Uh, I did a quick search of clinical trials uh, that use these stem cell-derived cell types, and in fact, there are clinical trials now open and ongoing, not just for diabetes, but for heart disease, Parkinson's, whoops, that was weird. <laughs> Blimey. I didn't touch anything, honest. All right. Okay. So, um, but I, I have to guess that every single person in the audience has a loved one or has had a loved one dealing with this. So this is, this is really, again, it leaves me speechless how far the field has come in the last 20 years and that... The promises we made 20 years ago about 
please invest in us and we will try to make your lives better. I, I'm happy to report back that we've, we've started to deliver on our promise. Um, so here's one example of a therapeutic that we're working on for really bad cases of, of inflammatory bowel disease where we are attempting to use our intestinal organoids to basically patch up some of these holes that people with inflammatory bowel disease have because if these lesions get really bad, the, the intestine can actually start to, to die or become too stiff or close up and you have to get surgical removal. And eventually if that happens too much, you don't have enough intestine left to absorb nutrients and you have to go on IV nutrition for the rest of your life. And that's the best possible outcome. There are plenty worse. So my colleague, Mike Helmrath, who is a pediatric surgeon by day and, and uh, uh, rat uh, transplanter by night, uh, tested our, uh, these organoids in, a, in an injury model in rat. And this is the upper panel here are, are the organoids that we generate. And these cells are brown because they're no longer rat cells, they're human cells that have gone and repaired a severe damaged bowel in that animal. So this is what we all have to do, these preclinical tests, before we can go take these cells into patients, we have to show that they actually work and cure a disease in an animal model. But so far, so good. Okay, so I'm gonna finish up the, the presentation uh, with some uh, ideas and, and about how we, the field is going to move forward. So I want to remind you that I've said that this has been a journey for many of us over the last 20 years. So turning a basic science discovery into a therapeutic takes time, and we are starting to, to get there, as I just said. Um, one of the big time sinks is, is when we make things in the laboratory, while that we do things in a clean way, the Food and Drug Administration needs things in a very clean way. So we have to now transition to therapeutic quality production of stem cells and organoids. Um, so we have to, you know, of course, undergo very important regulatory hurdles to, to make sure that, that cells can be transplantable. Um, we also have to learn how to make more complex organoids to treat more complex diseases. And I wanted to bring up the... the Something that scientists actually talk a lot about. You, you know, the, the folks who don't necessarily know scientists personally, you know, probably get a little bit of their impression of what scientists do from, from the movies. And some of that's real. We, we, a lot of us are ab absolute whack jobs, and, and m virtually none of us know how to dress properly. I mean, so a lot of the stereotypes are, are spot on. But one thing that is almost always wrong is that some t movies often portray scientists as like just trying wacky stuff regardless of any ethical implications, and that's not true. I would argue scientists are amongst the most ethical professions, not because we're born that way, but because we self-monitor each other every day, and we make sure that what we say is accurate and what we claim is in fact true. So we actually are all about ethics and ethical considerations around stem cell technologies and organoids. And here are some of the ethical considerations that we talk about on a routine basis that I'd be happy if any of you want any of us to elaborate on them. Please, please ask. So the first one is the cost of cell-based therapeutics. An average uh, hematopoietic stem cell transplant, a bone marrow transplant in, in our pediatric center might cost a million dollars. All right, so it's not cheap. Uh, and as we generate more stem cell and tissue therapeutics, it's going to be very expensive. How do we pay for it? Who gets it? And who decides, you know, what, what is paid for? Um, and because of the cost, there are a lot of unregulated stem cell therapies in other countries. So you've heard of, uh, of uh, what's the term? Uh, the uh, therapeutic tourism, I think, something like that, where people go to other countries to get stem cell therapies. A lot of times they're just getting, a, you know, snake oil, as, as the term would go. Um, but then there are, other, there are certain types of therapies that we're thinking about moving forward that involve cell types that we really have to think about. So, for example, those stem cells can be turned into, uh, uh, in mouse anyway, they've, they've only done it with mouse stem cells at the moment, but you can turn mouse stem cells into sperm and egg. Now, we haven't done that with human stem cells yet, and you might ask, you know, why should, why should we? But... Working at a pediatric hospital and seeing 
young kids, particularly uh, young girls, come in who need chemotherapeutic treatment because they have cancer. Oftentimes, they, they leave the hospital hopefully cured, but infertile. So wouldn't it be great if, 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 they, if we could, in the laboratory, allow them to regain fertility by making their own eggs? So there are a lot of really important reasons why this would be great, but it also raises the idea that if you can make sperm and egg in the laboratory, well, I guess the rest of us are kind of irrelevant for, for the species. So this is a really ethical, ethically important thing that, that we discuss very often. Um, in the news, you may have heard about these human mini-brains. They're not really mini-brains, but they are small brain organoids that are brilliant for studying things like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's and ADHD. They don't have consciousness, though, but they're incredibly useful to, to study the process and, and develop new drugs. And more recently, again, uh, and, and these, are all, these are all things, again, the global experts are sitting behind you. So if you have questions about them, we'll ask, ask the global experts. But one, an emerging concept and, and technology are actually synthetic embryos, where you can start with stem cells, get them to come together in a certain way where they actually start to form early stage embryos. And while this has, again, only been done with mouse stem cells, theoretically, it should be possible to do it with humans. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, one reason is... A lot of people who, are, who have fertility issues are because their embryos just don't make it to the point where they can, they can live. So maybe we could figure out why people are infertile in the laboratory using these synthetic embryos. So there are a lot of good reasons to do it. But again, for any new technology like AI, it can bring great strength, but it's also a, a, a scary new frontier that we have to be careful of and, and talk about honestly. All right. So like I said, the, the experts in all those areas are in the audience. We can ask questions. I, I need to thank my lab. That's really critical. Uh, uh, all the work that I showed from my lab were, were done by these folks in particular, uh, folks like Jason Spence, Jorge Minera, Heather McCauley, who all now have gone off to start their own research laboratories. My, my really great friends and colleagues, Aaron Zorn, my comrade, Taka Takebi, who helped run the or Stem Cell and Organoid Center and, and my funding source. Um, and and I'll, I'll leave with that, that this concept that, that, that started 20 years ago has, is now really fully taken off. And, and we have about 40 faculty now who use organoids to study all sorts of different diseases that impact lots and lots of people. And, and we hope to continue to make progress. And I thank you again, and uh, happy to open it up for discussion. Jim, that was fantastic. Sorry, I went a little long. <laughs> Not at all. That, could, that was inspiring and educational, and somewhere Dorcas Cummings is smiling. I'm quite sure of that. Um, you actually answered in your talk about 95% of the questions I was going to ask you. Um, but one thing, I, I, and I was going to ask you actually about the, the arc of your career, I mean, how you, didn't, you trained in biochemistry and molecular biology, and now you're a very hardcore developmental biologist. I noticed you missed in your sort of uh, summary of your resume, the fact that your very first research project was on wound healing, but in potatoes. <laughs> uh, so did plant biology miss a potential star when you moved into biomedicine? No, th 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 I'm glad you asked that question, because when I talk to students, um, you know, in this sort of format, um, for me anyway, I, I like to emphasize, and f I think for a lot of the scientists in the audience, you know, while we do hope that our research will, will help people to live healthier lives, a lot of us are just driven by intrinsic curiosity. And you could put a potato in front of you, in me. You could put a, you know, a, a fat cell in front of me, or, you know, an organoid, whatever. It's all fascinating. So I'll tell you, when I started my research on wound healing in potato uh, at University of Maine, I thought that was the coolest thing I'd ever done. <laughs> I mean, and at the time, it was. And then I was a technician at Jackson Laboratories working on how fat controls metabolism. 
at that point, I thought that was the coolest thing I've ever done. And, and the theme continues. So most of us are in, driven by intrinsic curiosity. And I think that's what makes us good scientists and what allows us to get through the hard times. Because research, as we all know, is really challenging. And it fails more often than it succeeds. And it's the intrinsic curiosity which really, I think, drives a lot of us. But I will really commend the, 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 my scientific colleagues. They've really also embraced the idea that their curiosity should be really help improve humankind. And, and I think that's you know, a great marriage of, of, of both sciences. Mm. I mean, the term curiosity-driven research is kind of equated with basic research. And we, this institution is devoted to the idea that basic research is important. Mm. Uh, you run a center that combines basic research and translational research. And you put that last slide of yours, you put up in your talk last night, it was an amazing array of diseases that your 40 faculty are investigating. I mean, how, how important is, do we still need to keep doing basic research? And organoids can obviously help with fundamental understanding of how embryos form and how cells connect. I would argue that we're, we haven't figured it all out yet. Yeah. So how organs form, how cells decide either to be healthy or to become cancerous, we're, we're still at the really early stages. So very clearly, we still need to do research. Um, and, I, I, and again, it, it's, it's great that we have people who, who want to devote their entire lives, you know, 80 hours a week, seven days a week, you know, to, to, to that fundamental research. And, yeah. My wife uh, uh, convinced me to, not that basic's a bad word, but to, to emphasize discovery-based research rather than basic. Because let's face it, what we do is anything but basic, yeah. right? Yeah, no, fair, uh, so very fair. So I think discovery-based research is, a, I think, a, a great way to, uh, to describe it more accurately. Yeah. Um, so you nearly, ex perhaps exclusively, work with induced um, pluripotent stem cells, but there are other kinds of stem cells. Mm -hmm. Is it f true to say that most stem cell research now is done with pluripotent stem cells? And is that because of uh, ethical and legal issues around embryonic stem cells and totipotent stem cells? So it, I, I didn't nuance it in the talk, and I'm glad you asked. So those really fancy stem cells I mentioned that can become any cell type of the body, called pluripotent stem cells. You can also get them, and historically they were obtained from fertilized eggs, from in vitro fertilization clinics, so people who, who want to have kids and, and can't do it the normal way, go in, into an in vitro fertilization clinic, sperm and egg meat, you have a, a fertilized egg in the, in the test tube. Um, when patients decide that they're done growing their family, if they have extra fertilized eggs that are frozen down, they're usually discarded. Um, about, oh gosh, how many years ago now? 20 years ago, um, uh, uh, scientists dis, uh, figured out a way to take some of those, what would have been discarded fertilized eggs, and turn them into these pluripotent stem cells. Those are called, and you probably remember those from back in the day called embryonic stem cells. Those are functionally equivalent to what, what we were discussing, these induced pluripotent stem cells that you can make experimentally now. Uh, we still use embryonic stem cells uh, because they are really the, the gold standard. So when, when we work out a new organoid technology, a lot of times we use that and then confirm that it works with any of the patient-derived cells. So they're still absolutely essential. Um, but they are not required now as they were. And, and I will say that this is back in the day when political compromise wasn't such a dirty word because under the Bush administration, they compromised and said, in fact, we are going to allow human embryonic stem cells research within a limited framework. And that was a compromise. I mean, and, and I do give, give the, the administration credit. Um, so we still use those lines. And again, one fertilized egg 
one cell line, and that cell line has, from that one egg has been growing now for 20 years and has been a research driver for hundreds of different laboratories. So for me, that, that is a, a reasonable balance. But I'm glad you mentioned it because it, it is still, those are still important as basic research tools. And even though we only, we only have a handful of them and we've had the same ones for 20 years, mm. they're still extraordinarily useful. Right. Um, so the, the mechanism of producing these induced pluripotent stem cells is essentially reprogramming the, genet- the genetic uh, mechanisms under, that, that uh, drive the cells. Um, do you perceive risks associated with that reprogramming that might uh, appear once they're being used, you know, say in a therapeutic context? You know, so far there haven't really been many examples where there is a risk from using those stem cells versus embryonic or, or adult beyond, beyond what we already acknowledge. So as far as I know, and, and this is where anyone in the audience, any of the scientists in the audience, as far as I know, induced pluripotent stem cells versus embryonic stem cells in terms of therapeutic uh, derivatives and, and risks from those, I, I'm not aware that there is a specific one with induced yeah. pluripotent stem cells that is, isn't also in any of the other stem cell types. Right. But right. if anyone has a, knows of a, an IPS-specific risk, speak now. Well, speaking of speaking now, I think we have microphones uh, around. Um, questions from the audience. It would, it would be easy for me to just talk to Jim for the entire evening, yeah, but uh, I don't want to hog the floor. Blake. Hmm. at fostering intrinsic curiosity? And if so, what about the United States fosters intrinsic curiosity? I don't know who that's from. That's probably that one. Um, So intrinsic curiosity is a human trait. It's certainly not specific to the US, but certainly support of fun foundational research historically has been incredibly rich. And I, I meant that in a philosophic, not monetary way, but also in a monetary way. Uh, the, the U.S. government, you folks, your tax dollars, have gone to support billions and billions of, of dollars of research. Uh, and, and we have led in the investment in research, I think, globally. And I think we still do, but in the last 20 or 30 years, uh, a, a lot of our collabor- collaborative countries have, have really stepped up their game. So Europe now has really incredible stem cell organoid foundational research. Japan is one of the leading countries. And this is a great segue to, to give credit to Shinya Yamanaka, who, uh, a Japanese scientist who uh, won the Nobel Prize along with an English scientist, uh, Sir John Gurdon now, I guess when you get a Nobel Prize, you get knighted, so that's pretty cool. We don't have that in the U.S. So. <laughs> um, but, but Japan is really leading the way in induced pluripotent stem cell therapeutics. And that is because they, the government has invested in turning stem cells into new therapies. So I think a lot of other countries are, are fantastic partners now with, with U.S. colleagues, uh, uh, for, for sure. Another question? How long is it, uh, two part question, how long does it take to develop an organoid? And once you develop it, can that be used to replace an organ or is it just used for research? So the the first answer to the question, um, it depends on the organoid. So if you want to make a, uh, an intestinal organoid in the laboratory, at least the, the first part of that takes about a month. Um, if you want to make a brain organoid and get it to the point where you can actually study, you know, certain, you know, Parkinson's, that sort of thing, sometimes it might take a year to grow an organoid. Um, now, once you make an organoid, and, and I, I should point out that organoids themselves are at the very early stages of, of trying to be used for therapeutics. 
So, for example, pancreatic organoids that make insulin-producing cells, um, those get made over about a month, and they can go right into a patient with diabetes. And, and I'm making it, I simplified it a little bit, but essentially that's, that's about how it works. Now, a lot of times what they do is they make, you know, now for therapeutics, you have to make a lot of them. Um, so it might take a while to grow up enough for the patients you need, but, but by and large, it, it takes about that long. Now, of course, in the, in the intestinal tract, I, I, was, I actually was going to have a prop of showing how long the intestinal tract is, <laughs> but suffice it to say, we can't make a full intestine yet, and that's why we think the first therapeutic might be to treat uh, either in inflammatory bowel disease or, or things where we can actually just try to, like reseeding your lawn in the springtime, it's got holes in it. So we're going to use organoids to fill in the lawn to try to make it functional again. So we're doing that. Yeah, so uh, again, the, the guy I'm working with is a, a pediatric surgeon. So he can just put a, put a scope, right? Well, this is, this is how we're planning on doing it, and th this is how he does it in rats, where he just puts a scope in there and he puts the organoids in, and they sort of act as a, as a balm, as a Band-Aid when they, when they attach, and then they, they just patch up the damage. And again, this isn't only in animals at the moment, but that's how they seem to work. Yeah. So, Jim, just to be clear, um, <clears throat> in the case of the pancreas, pancreatic or organoids, they, you can only um, transplant those cells that have been derived from that particular patient. No, actually, oh, uh, they're, well, yeah, they're, they're doing an off-the-shelf. Um, yeah. In fact, what about immunological rejection? Though? So, in in patients that are that would get this therapy, um, they already have, if they have type 1 diabetes, they auto ha already have autoimmune rejection of beta cells, so those patients would go on immunosuppression. Right, right, got it. But, um, but this is a good point that, that John's raising. In the future, when I can make a stem cell from you, grow up tissues in the lab, put them back in for whatever, you know, in 30 years when you're suffering from something, It'll be your own cells, and there's no need for immunosuppression. Yeah. In moving forward, that's the hope. Right. Will there be a day when you can create a new joint? Because now we put all these metal joints in knees and hips. <laughs> yeah, actually. Uh, uh, or is it too expensive? It will be way too expensive right now. It's a good point. At the moment, probably you know, artificial uh, is best. But the last uh, example I, I mentioned on there going to clinical trials was actually cartilage. Um, which is not a joint, but you know, in terms of people who suffer from cartilage injury and, and debilitating pain, uh, that that is in clinical trials in in Japan actually. May, may I ask a comment one? and then a question? The comment is: You are so clear in how you say what you say that I comprehend it. To some wonderful degree, small but wonderful, and I can take it home and be excited about it and tell my kids a bit about stuff coming in the future. Thank you for being so clear, especially your analogy with reseeding the lawn. Um, and the question is, you said you use embryonic, embryonic stem cells from uh, in vitro... Uh, uh, stuff that would have been discarded. Mm. I am thinking about Henrietta Lacks and mm. what was done without her permission, which at the time was, I don't think anybody thought much about it. Later they realized it was an invasion of privacy, etc. How are, are you handling that issue with those embryonic stem cells that would have been discarded? No, that, that's a, a, first of all, thank you very much. I, I, I appreciate that. I, I'm really glad that, that you, you understood even, you know, part of the talk. And, and tell your kids that science is amazing and that they should go into research. <laughs> you know, rock stars, Taylor Swift, all that good stuff, you know, they're special, but science is, is really the cool stuff. Um, in terms of, uh, let me actually speak towards the, the, uh, the, the stem cells that we make from patients currently, just, just to kind of as an inroad, we are exquisitely careful about asking for permission for exactly what we want to do with them. 
the, the stem cell lines that were made 20 years ago, not by us, but, but uh, um, by others, uh, uh, um, uh, those were also consented by, by the, the parents who, who generated the sperm and the egg and, and the embryo. They weren't perfectly consented, though. And we learned from that, actually, uh, quite a bit, because now the way we consent patients is we just lay it all out. We're like, in, in some cases, this might be used to generate therapeutics. In some cases, it, it'll be used for research. We're going to grow different types of organs. And at some point, it might be commercialized. So we do lay it all out, and so they get, as we call it, fully informed consent. And, and that's a really important thing. And again, the scientific community has really come together to make sure that even globally we're doing it properly and, and we don't have that same issue because it's critically important. No, go on. Um, how do you actually harvest the stem cells? Is it, is it all because, is it blood or is it tissue? Or? Yeah, no, uh, great question. Uh, if, if we want to make those really fancy stem cells that can become anything in the body, the great thing is any part of the body can become one of those. So how we do it is we get a little bit of blood. That's, that's the easiest. Uh, and then we take some of those blood cells. We actually have a facility uh, that does it for us. They, met, they use a whole bunch of interesting manipulations. And at the end of the day, we get back those really impressive stem cells, all starting from just a, a small bit of blood. But you can do it from cells in urine. You can do it from skin cells, from any cell in the body. Uh, you can generate these really fancy, amazing stem cells. And that, again, is all because of that Nobel Prize winning technology developed by, by this Japanese scientist, Shinya Yamanaka. I have one more question is, uh, do you have like a stem cell bank? So you can, when you wanted to you know, research a specific one, can you go to the bank and, and yeah. find those cells? That's a fantastic question. We are, at the moment, building disease stem cell banks. Um, so at a pediatric center, we focus more on pediatric diseases, but we have a, a, a fairly substantial number of kids who come in with early onset inflammatory bowel disease because of their genetic makeup. So we're now making banks of stem cell lines so that we can actually start screening for drugs that will help early onset IBD. My colleague Taka Takebi is doing the same thing with early onset forms of liver disease. So that's exactly what we're doing. We're making these stem cell banks and distributing them to other researchers around the world. I mean, I know cancer organoid banks like Dave Tuvison's generating, he's provided them to other pancreatic cancer researchers so that they can move the field faster. So great question, thank you. Other questions? Uh, yeah, I think I yeah. had one. Uh, thank you. I just had a question. How does the private sector fit into this? So are there specific biotech companies, things like that, that are investing in this? It seems like the government funds a lot of this, but I'm just wondering how biotech, pharma companies, how, how all that fits into this. No, an another great question that, that we are tackling, uh, that most of us are tackling, the, the federal funding for research a lot of that is, is mostly to discover the technology, but to actually turn that technology into something uh, uh, commercializable, uh, they call it the, the valley of death, you know, because it's really, it's hard to get funding to do that. Uh, in the stem cell and organoid space, it's, it's a little bit easier because of the, the immediate applications, but even our own, uh, and our, our own center has been trying to do that. Uh, uh, so it is possible, um, but it is challenging because a lot of academic centers are not business savvy, and they try to commercialize stuff themselves, and they don't necessarily know how to do it well. So I think uh, biotech and pharma need to uh, be a little more accepting of risk and invest in these sorts of technologies a bit earlier than they might otherwise, uh, and, and they are doing that. In fact, a lot of pharma companies now are even developing their own organoid uh, banks and whatnot in collaboration with academicians. So it is possible, but it's still something that I think we don't do well, uh, that transition from academic discovery to, to uh, commercial therapeutics uh, down the road. Jim, the, the protocols, that the, in the laboratory protocols that mm -hmm. drive these 
uh, this work, are they sufficiently standardized to satisfy the requirements of uh, a biotech company, for example? Yeah, I, I, that's a big point. Um, probably not. I mean, the protocols themselves probably are, but they have to be really standardized to do high-throughput drug discovery so that every organoid behaves the same every time, every time you throw a different drug at it. So I, I think that is exactly the, the, the issue. Mm -hmm. And getting things that standardized and getting things automated so that you can have robots doing all the, the heavy lifting, that's actually really hard. And we actually have a, a, at our center a, a, a separate laboratory committed to what we call de-risking technologies. So try to get those technologies a bit further along so that then drug companies will adopt them for drug screening platforms. But that's a, it takes a lot. Yeah. And, and frankly, it's it's not necessarily what discovery-based scientists really like doing because yeah. it's it's yeah. fairly mind-numbing. You might want to mention about Doug Melton going to industry and related that to that other question because sometimes that's a good path to commercialize. Yeah, Did, was that a question or do you want? <laughs> no, I'm just in terms of uh, you could mention or I could mention it, but uh, sometimes academics go into industry because they've spent their lifetime trying to develop a product and it's easier to do it in industry for the reasons that just Jim just said. Actually, didn't Hans Klevers go to Roche? He did. Yes, the, he did. The, the pioneer of a lot of this organized yeah. technology. Yeah. Yeah. So question I, over there? I, I think this is a somewhat related question. I'm, I'm interested in the research to practice gap. You know, uh, in the story that you uh, shared about, I think it was a child that you mentioned who had a syndrome of issues uh, that you were able to kind of diagnose by building an organoid and doing some diagnostic testing. Did you, maybe I missed it, did you say how long that, or, that process took? And can you say a little bit about the, the adoption window? How long does it take for these therapeutic approaches to move towards adoption in practice? Yeah, so the adult stem cell field is a bit further along. Um, so, for example, uh, the, uh, one of the scientists we just mentioned, Hans Cleaver, is a real pioneer of organoid biology. Um, they've been generating uh, intestinal organoids from adult intestine, and, and they're actually now using them uh, to pre-screen uh, cystic fibrosis drugs, because the intestine actually is one of the main diseased organs in cystic fibrosis. So, and in that case, they can go from patient biopsy to organoid to drug testing in the span of a few weeks. Uh, so that can be really rapid. In our case, it's a bit more of a heavy lift, and that's why the organoids that we make are perhaps better for some of these more complicated diseases that involve a lot of moving parts and, and, and impact the organ in a more complicated way. Uh, so it really depends on the, the question and the application. So it, but it can be really, really rapid. So getting back to that, that patient, since they had a congenital malformation and they were coming into the hospital constantly over the span of years, uh, it took us about six months to start to perform that, six to 12 months to, to make the, the stem cells, grow the organoids and diagnose them and get back to the patient. But it's actually kind of in real time. So like we would do experiments, we'd go chat with our clinical colleagues saying, look for this, this, and this, and they would go do it, and then we'd keep working in the lab. So it was kind of a, a, an iterative process. But at the end of the day, and, and then we'd talk to them, and, and they would go and biopsy the patient. So it, it was, you know, it was a team effort. But for those really complicated diseases, it really does take a lot more, and there's a lot more moving parts. Well, was there any discussion that specific organites can be patented? So certainly... Um, uh, yes. Uh, so we hold patents on how to, to, to make certain organoids, and some of those pat patents we license f to companies like Stem Cell Technologies for basic research, um, you know, so, so that other people can grow these organoids to do research in their lab. So they make kits, and you just you get one of these, and you open it up, and it gives you all the instructions on how to make an organoid and all the, all the reagents to do it. So it's, it's pretty nifty. It's only used for... Ba for basic research at this point. Um, but for sure there is a lot of, there are a lot of lawyers making a lot of money around stem cell and organoid technologies. 
So a lot of people have patented technologies and are trying to commercialize it. The, the, the ones that are going to clinic, most certainly the, the methods to make those are, are patented. It's a bit dicier patenting actual cells and tissues if they actually exist in nature. So, for example, you, you know, I, I can't patent beta cells because we all have beta cells. I wouldn't have the right. But maybe Doug certainly has a patent on how to make beta cells from stem cells. Mm. I, I was I'm wondering how to restrict the uh, generations of, of organoids you implant and uh, how to maintain the terminal states you want to guide in vivo. Oh, so you know, what was the second question? The second question is, uh, is, is two questions. First, uh, first is how to restrict the, ge the generations of organ noise you employ in, in the patient. And the second is how to maintain the terminal states you want to get. Right. So how to, how, to how to keep them localized to the site of injury, you mean, when you say restrict the organoids in the patients? Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 need, mm. a, you need to keep, keep them in your... Uh, some generations, for example, you need to limit it into, for example, 10 generations, say 7, 10. How do you limit it, uh, the generations in vivo? Yeah, so, so in vivo, certainly, uh, uh, we're working with bi uh, biotechnologists, biomedical engineers, mm -hmm. to develop matrix proteins, so things that will cause the, the cells that we put in in vivo to stick to the site and to kind of glue them in place. Uh, we're working with biomedical engineers to do that. And I still am not sure what the second question was. It's how to maintain the terminal state, terminal state of the uh, organoids. So how to maintain them? Uh, a lot of these organoids, so in some cases, uh, for example, with, with pancreatic beta cells, they don't divide anymore. So once you put a stem cell-derived beta cell into the patient, it's going to live as long as it lives. And normally beta cells live for the lifetime of the patient. We hope that the stem cell derived beta cells will continue to live, mm -hmm. but they might die out. But the great thing is we can make more. We can make bucket loads of them. In the other organs like the intestine, the cells we're putting in there, we hope will stick to the injury site and then they will just repopulate themselves for the life of the patient because intestinal cells <laughs> continue to grow and, and proliferate for the life of the patient. So it'll depend on the disease. Mm, thank you. <laughs> One last question. Yeah. Can, you, can you clarify what the origin of these stem cells are uh, that you use, the tissue that you use to divide, to, to get the stem cells other than the fertilized egg? Sure. Situation. Yeah, I, I, I didn't go into a lot of detail because it's, it's fairly tech heavy, but let, let me um, try to simplify it. Hopefully you're, you, you live to 150 and you, you die in your sleep. But if in fact you, you had some uh, in the future uh, uh, a malady that we think we might be able to therapeutically treat using this approach, what we would do is we'd bring you into the hospital, we would take a little bit of your blood, and then we'd send you home. And then we would take that blood and move it to our stem cell uh, our core facility and they would, take, they would isolate some cells, blood cells, and they would insert a, 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 a bunch, a, three or four different genes into those cells just for a, a tiny little while. And what those genes do when they turn on is they, they, and I call it magic because we know how it happens, but to me it's still magical. They magically turn that blood cell into one of these stem cells. And that stem cell has the same genetic material as, as, as you. So, those so those are your stem cells. using hematopoietic stem cells in most of your work. Yeah, no, so we don't have to use hematopoietic. Uh, we wouldn't have to use blood. We can use any cell uh, 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 f to make these magical stem cells right. because skin or blood or even hair, uh, any, any cell in your body can be genetically, magically pushed into this stem cell. Now, blood stem cells already exist in your body right now. Mm -hmm. They replenish your blood like once a month, or maybe faster, I'm not sure. Um, and and they, that, those blood stem cells can become red blood cells, white blood cells, T cells, all of the above. But those naturally exist. So if you were to come in and you had a blood disorder, um, 
what they would do is they would actually take your blood stem cells and try to maybe fix if it were a genetic thing and then put your blood stem cells back in. But if you haven't, if something else is sick, you know, if you have diabetes, your blood stem cells aren't going to help. And that's where we're turning them into this other. Uh, well, that's what I was asking. Other than hematopoietic stem cells, there are other tissues that you will use to go to beta cells or however you want to do it. Yeah, yeah. So you can, you can make beta cells from any other cell type of your body using this approach. You don't need blood. You don't need anything particular. Well, Jim, I think we could go on and on, but we have other things to do, unfortunately. This has been fantastic, inspiring, informative, everything that we hope for. Thank, Thank you, you very much indeed. A pleasure. So thank you very much for coming. Uh, for those of you who are going to the dinner parties, uh, there will be signs outside, um, and there is cocktails in the, uh, in the tent for those who are staying here. So thanks very much, and thank, thank you, Jim and John.